of that responsibility uh, given certain events. So you might imagine from the way I'm speaking now that the trade receivable put is completely non cancelable There is no option for the provider of the put coverage to back out of their obligation. There is no stop shipment event in the trade receivable put. Uh, so it's truly non cancelable High yield and distressed names, the insurance market and factory markets tend to, as credit deteriorate, back off of their coverage. Uh, and as the credit really deteriorates, that's when you start to get a dynamic of those providers canceling lines. One of the interesting features of the debt capital markets is that they tend to be available. The bond and loan markets and derivatives markets tend to be open to a credit up to the day it files for bankruptcy. Uh, because of that dynamic of our market staying open for so long into the credit cycle, we are able to offer coverage with the put on many names which are traditionally not covered in insurance or factoring. Uh, so, so many of the distressed uh, high yield uh, uh, retailers in the U.S., which always tend to be enormously levered, which the uh, insurance and factoring market is, is not so comfortable with our names where we are able to offer coverage in, in many instances. In that case, though, it becomes a matter of price. So our counterparties in the capital markets are allowed to take risk. They just have to justify to their bosses at the end of the day that the premium they receive for that risk was appropriate. And this is a big reason why I think there's a misconception that the trade receivable is very, very expensive. A lot of people don't know that we cover names that are better rated credits, high grade credits, not high yield and distressed. And since they're only looking at us for the very distressed names, our pricing for those distressed names tends to be quite high. But it's not a fair comparison because we're offered a cover of that name where insurance and factoring is closed. So we were open, but we're open at a price. We tend to be a lot more competitive when we're talking about the non-distressed names in the world. Uh, but that is one of the interesting features of the receivable put is we're open on a lot of names where others are not. Trade credit insurance and factoring tend to be written on a portfolio basis. So a lot of insurers and factors are, are more comfortable taking risk to a portfolio of underlying obligors. And if you're looking for protection on one single obligor, they tend to require that you deliver a portfolio of risk against the one or two names that you really want protection on. Our product is completely single name. So we are not going to require that you deliver a portfolio of risk to us just to get coverage on the one or two names or whatever specific names that you're looking for protection on, so it's not portfolio. Uh, the execution of our product tends to be quite easy. Uh, we do not have to go through a long underwriting process on the obligors. I understand that insurance and factoring can be pretty laborious to put in place because of that. Uh, our product uh, when, when documentation is, is put in place, and the documentation tends to be fairly simple, it's governed under a master agreement, which is executed one time. Uh, once that master agreement is executed, we can put protection in place in as little as a half hour or an hour is what we've been able to do. So the execution is very quick, very easy. Uh, one of the core features that I wanted to focus on a little bit today here also is capacity. So what the, a lot of the deals Dave Hardigan and I have been working on uh, over the past three or four months have to do with working alongside insurance, the capacity that the insurance market currently is popped out on or does not have for specific credits. Sprint, Best Buy are two examples of specific credits where we are finding that the insurance markets are topped out in terms of their capacity. And there's opportunities here to run the receivable put alongside standard insurance to meet the capacity constraints which the insurance market currently has. Bombardier is another name which is currently, it seems like every day there's a new credit where we're being asked to cover because the insurance market is topped out in terms of capacity. Uh, our tenor is very interesting. So when we look at the insurance markets, they tend to offer one year of coverage or no coverage at all. It's a one year market essentially. The receivable put for our platform, for the Wells Fargo platform, has a minimum coverage period of 90 days. And depending on our view of a credit, we've been able to go out a little bit past three years of coverage and offer a lot of different uh, maturities in between the 90 days and three years. So we're very flexible in terms of tenure, which if you think about that a little bit deeper, allows us to put some very interesting hedge strategies in place 
by laddering out various maturities of receivable foot coverage. Uh, so we can do a, a 90-day, a six-month, a one-year, a two-year, and a three-year put on the same obligor and kind of ladder that in. So it allows us to be very flexible uh, on that. And then finally, uh, deductibles, coinsurance, that, that type of, uh, of policy does not happen in receivable put. This is pure 100% recovery instrument. Um, factoring is, is very similar to that. Uh, the internal credit risk me methods are definitely something you are all experts on, I imagine, so we're not going to touch there. And the last thing I'll touch on in this slide are market-based instruments like credit default swaps, zero recovery swaps. A lot of people on this line, actually, because uh, it, it, from the way you responded on receivable put, I'm assuming that in terms of capital markets, this is probably a group which has a, a bit more education in the capital markets than most do. Uh, a lot of people probably looked at the credit default swap. And essentially what we created with the receivable put is a better alternative to a credit default swap for managing AR credit risk. Problems with the credit default swap are that, number one, a credit default swap is a derivative instrument. Your account is going to tell you that it requires mark market accounting, which makes everybody on the line kind of gasp and want to go running away. Uh, the receivable put, Dave and I do not offer accounting advice, even though Dave is an accountant. Uh, but what your accountant will tell you is that this product is specifically designed to not be a derivative, does not require hedge accounting treatment. Your accountant is going to account for this just like they do uh, a trade credit insurance policy. So it's a non-derivative. And more importantly, the credit default swap, these capital markets instruments are designed to offer you protection on a specific bond or a loan. A credit default swap actually references a bond, QSIP, the actual bond identifier. And the problem there is that you get on a credit default swap when it triggers one minus the recovery rate of that bond. And everybody on the line can appreciate the difference between the bond issuing entity and the account receivable invoicing entity. And you can instantly see how those recoveries won't line up in most cases. So the receivable put has been designed to remove the shortcomings of the derivatives. And what it's doing is it's offering you a non-mark-to-market -market instrument, and it's offering you a head to get to your specific account receivable invoicing entities, and it's eliminating what I call basis risk in, in, in market speak, but eliminating the difference between the bond entity and the account receivable entity. So moving on to how the trade receivable put actually works. As Tom mentioned, it's a very straightforward product. Uh, the mechanics uh, are very, very simple. It's not a standardized product is that the client pays a fixed fee for a, a fixed amount of protection for a fixed term. Uh, two of those three elements are determined by the buyer, so it's very much a bespoke product. Uh, the, the, the first two elements, uh, the, in terms of the amount and the term, uh, those are set by yourself, and as Tom mentioned, it's very flexible in terms of the, the type of duration that we can put in place with the trade receivable we'll put. We can also do some laddering where you, you can hedge out a core amount for a certain period of time and then shorter data contracts can handle any variability uh, in your forecasting for your activity. In, in the contract itself, it's, it's an obligation between the vendor and the seller of protection. In this case, it's Wells Fargo Bank, a AA minus rated entity. And what the client is really buying here is the, the right to sell eligible claims to the bank the event. Uh, and under uh, a very familiar view, if you're familiar with CDS, they include insolvency, uh, winding up, Chapter 7, Chapter 11, uh, typically the types of uh, bankruptcy triggers that you would see in CDS. So if during the period of the contract there is no bankruptcy of the obligor, the contract expires any further payment. The other, if there is bankruptcy during the right to receive and the previous part of the West case, uh, hedge 20 million with one particular obligor, putting it simply, you get 20 million from uh, Wells Fargo Bank upon delivering uh, the receivables to Wells Fargo. What's involved in that is basically the invoices uh, and any other documentation that actually proves and helps substantiate the claim. I think some common uses and advantages of the trade receivable put, and, and maybe to, to expand a little bit on the previous page, 
uh, the, the non-cancelability of the receivable put, you're going to find with this product that there is not a list of 100 different items that you need to meet in order to maintain receivable put coverage like you do with the trade credit insurance policy. So the only way that a receivable put, I tell all of our clients, the only way a receivable put will not perform is if there is no bankruptcy claim in the background to give to Wells Fargo if we hit a trigger. So all of the other stipulations that need to be met with an insurance policy, and I imagine all of you have to keep full-time teams in place to, to meet those, those needs, don't exist. But the way that this product uh, does, does essentially not settle is if there is no bankruptcy claim. So it's all predicated on the physical delivery of a bankruptcy claim to Wells Fargo in exchange for 100% recovery. I, you buy $100 of protection from Wells Fargo for the next year. You pay a fixed fee. It's not floating. It's fixed, paid up front, so you don't have to worry about the price moving around on you. If a bankruptcy occurs, you purchase the right to deliver up to $100 in claims to Wells Fargo in exchange for 100% recovery. So you deliver $100 in claims to us at a trigger, and then 35 to 45 days after, a uh, very quick process, you are then paid a $100 recovery on that. For the next slide, page six, uh, common uses, advantages of trade receivable protection. Uh, as we, we covered a little bit, I'm going to glance over these quickly. High yield and distressed credits. We're the market that's open when others are closed, and a lot of us know that. There, it is at a price, which we need to consider, but yeah, we tend to be open on a lot of credits which the others are closed to, which can be an advantage. Investment grade credits. This is a world where a lot of people never even consider us or, or think to consider us. The cost of our coverage, it's still the same product, still non-cancelable, all the same determining factors, but you would find if you looked at our price on investment grade credits, it's a fraction of what it is for a distressed credit. Uh, and fraction is probably understating it. If, if, if there's even more than a fraction, if there's something else I can describe that uh, where it's even smaller than, than I would, it's, uh, it's a fraction of the cost. Uh, we can be used alongside trade credit insurance. Underwriters these days, we're hearing a lot, and we're talking directly to underwriters that are capacity constraints on, on various credits. If you're an electronics guy, then uh, Best Buy is, is, is the common theme there. Uh, if you're in telco space, then Sprint, there, there's various names that the credit insurance market is constrained on. We can work alongside the insurers on that. We don't. It does not have to be either use insurance or use the put. They can be used at the same time, and we can help you structure that. Um, ABL transaction, something we're going to discuss in the case studies. We are running into a lot of our clients who utilize an ABL, an asset-based lending program, to generate working capital for, for, their, for their working capital needs. And they run into capacity constraints. Uh, they run into concentrations because of the, the concentration uh, they bump up against concentration limits. We have already implemented the receivable put in several cases to support the accounts receivable in an ABL to uh, gain better treatment or to gain capacity or to relieve the concentration in the ABL to help them from a working capital perspective. Same in aspect securitizations. We also support factoring transactions. We can execute directly with a factor. We can execute with the client of a factor, and the factor could then allow better advance rates or better pricing, whatever it may be, but you can see how we can be used to support that also. Uh, again, this product, 100% non-canceled protection, that's the entire crux of this product in, in my mind. The stress names is another one of the nice features of it. We offer protection in the names that others don't. We're a single name instrument, so we're not going to ask you to deliver a portfolio. The terms are flexible. I just caught a mistake in our slides here, which you always do after you start making a presentation. It's three months to three years. We can't go shorter than six. Another common misconception with this product is that everybody thinks that we're only out to do very, very large transactions. And I think everybody is, but that's, that's not true. Uh, with our platform at Wells Fargo, we'll do uh, put protection in place as small as 500,000 notional. And we've gone as large as we've actually quoted for and $500 million notional. So we've got a lot of flexibility in terms of the, of the size of the trades we can do. No co-insurance, no deductible. Uh, the other thing I touched on before, but I want to harp on a little bit here, is the reporting, the accounting, the payment process. Uh, we don't require that you update us on terms. We don't require that you, you have to put do any of that updating 
uh, work to keep coverage in place. If you change terms with your client from 30 to 180 days or whatever it may be, there's no requirement that you notify us about that. So in terms of uh, the product and managing the product and making sure your coverage is still in place, this is very, very easy when compared to uh, trade credit insurance. So in terms of understanding who who is covered, what kind of what's the universe of obligors? Well, well, essentially it's it's many public or indeed private companies. Uh, really, all we're looking for is that they they're very active, they're large with liquid publicly traded debt or equity. Uh, it's across all sectors um, on a case by case basis. Um, certainly at Wells Fargo, we will look at larger private companies as long as really we can get access to financial statements, and that's either through your own relationship. Uh, with that company or uh, any other relationship really it's just principally driven on getting access to the financial so that credit decisions can be made and as Tom mentioned where we sit within Wells we sit within the principal investing group there's over 100 employees and analysts uh, primarily based over in on the west coast Tom and I are the uh, the trade receiver put effort here in New York um, we can get those financials to them and at, on a case-by-case -case basis we can look at those companies what's actually covered uh, it's uh, often a misconception with this is that it's, it's only really covering uh, goods that are sold to uh, an obligor, but in actual fact it covers services as well. So if you have an entity that's not only providing goods, uh, but also they're so specialist in nature that they require some amount of ongoing maintenance and specialist personnel or expertise that you provide to that customer, uh, all of those uh, services are also included, uh, and indeed any professional services as well anything provide, provided prior to bankruptcy. Just as providing, uh, of course, that the AOR are, are not under dispute uh, at that time. Uh, importantly, the client needs to retain title to the receivables, and the client also needs to be responsible for, uh, directly responsible for the, rece the receivable from that obligor. In terms of uh, presenting the documentation, uh, the actual existence of the AOR, we, we don't necessarily in fact, uh, and I know a lot of you are listening right now, you're probably going to raise your eyebrows as, as we say this, but we don't look involved uh, when you put the traders will put in place. So we don't look to get involved in the underlying commercial transaction to understand exactly what's going on and to try and limit or put in place regarding the level of activity. Essentially, we're just concerned that in the, in the event of a bankruptcy that you're delivering to us eligible receivables. That's going to be evidenced by a documentation trail that includes invoices, purchase orders, shipping documents, bills of lading, anything like that, and, and even email communication uh, with the obligor that just helps substantiate those claims. In terms of the, uh, the actual fees, I mentioned earlier on there were three elements to the, to the trade receivable put, the, the fixed amount, the fixed term, which is going to be driven by the client, and then the actual cost of the put itself. Uh, those fees would be driven by uh, the, the current debt capital markets pricing, both for idiosyncratic risk associated with the obligor, but also just generally the tone of the credit markets and where they are uh, at any one point in time. As Tom mentioned, unfortunately in the past, the trade receivable put has uh, suffered a little bit from being pigeonholed into uh, an understanding that it's a, it's a product that really is very, very expensive because it's often used for distressed names. Um, and that, that's very much the case. If you if you come to us at the point when a particular credit is actually uh, very distressed in the marketplace, uh, the pricing is going to reflect that. But there are points in time and some examples that we have later in the presentation which will show you that on a proactive basis, given where some entities are pricing right now, you can be proactive in terms of putting in place trade receivable put protection at very, very affordable and probably historically tight levels in some cases. Um, it's also going to be driven by market liquidity as well. Uh, it, somebody is coming in looking for coverage on a particular name, we want to make sure that uh, any way that we're hedging ourselves on the other side is in a pretty good move uh, the market and, and force a change sensitive to that as well. Uh, the notional amount clearly is going to be a, a driver of that because if there is price elasticity for certain names, uh, we want to make sure that we're managing that. And we have come up with a couple of ways in the past which we're happy to discuss with you offline about about managing uh, the execution of some of these trade receivable puts. Uh, pricing can range from as little as low as four to five basis points per month to in excess of 200 basis points per month. Uh, in the last few months, we've seen certain names out there in the retail space where they're very, very distressed in nature. Trade credit insurance is unavailable on the name, and that particular credit was actually writing at two and a half to three, uh, three percent per month, which for many 
uh, looking to put in place three or six month coverage that potentially has the or has the potential, I should say, to, to wipe out a, a vendor's margins in a, in a commercial transaction. So uh, very much the uh, emphasis that Tom and I would have today is looking at using the trade receivable put on a proactive basis so that you can protect those margins and put in place uh, coverage that can give you the confidence that uh, you've locked it in uh, despite what happens to their credit over the period of the hedge. One other thing I might comment in terms of pricing, that the, the current dynamic in the capital markets, simply there's a a lot of investor money chasing after very little supply of things for the investor money to invest in. And what that creates in the capital markets is a very, very low yield environment. And that benefits the receivable put because as the spreads or yields are very low in, in the capital markets, pricing on receivable put benefits from that becomes cheaper. And uh, that won't remain there forever, but it, the, the capital markets have, have not traded this type in history. So again, because capital markets are trading with that specific dynamic, it creates an opportunity to put receivable put pricing in place at, at historically low levels. If you did look at the receivable put one, two years ago, you'll notice that pricing on most credits right now is, is substantially cheaper than where it was just a couple years ago. Oh, sorry. So here we uh, the timeline, uh, very quick slide here. Uh, the timeline to uh, when a receivable put triggers is in from the time it triggers to the time you get paid on the obligation is very quick. It's a minimum with ours, by the way, with the Wells Fargo platform, it's a minimum of 35 days, maximum of 45 days after the trigger. There's a very short time period where you're going to deliver essentially what amounts to proof of claim. Uh, it invoices things that Dave described in the previous slide, but it's essentially uh, as whatever you think your proof of the claim may be, you're going to deliver to Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo takes a very short time period to review that and try to determine whether or not the claim is valid. Uh, this is all because we are going to pay you well ahead of legal final order of a bankruptcy. So the courts are not going, we're not waiting for the court to determine that your bankruptcy claim is valid. We're not doing that, we're paying you well ahead of that. Uh, and then uh, there's a short period of time again for us to review the information you're sending us, and then again, minimum of 35 days, maximum of 45 days after that trigger, uh, you get paid 100% recovery against claims you would deliver to Wells Fargo Bank and uh, A. And again, we are not waiting uh, for legal final order, which is something that you can't see in other platforms in the receivable put, but our specific platform pays all of our clients in the receivable put 35 to 45 days after trigger. So this next slide, uh, Tom earlier on uh, talked about some of the features of trade credit insurance. This next slide really just uh, sets the trade receivable put product side by side with credit insurance and identifies a number of those key features uh, and sets them apart. Once again, to, to restate, this isn't to besmirch the trade credit insurance market. Um, there certainly are features of trade credit insurance, inc including coverage of foreign entities uh, and uh, things such as protracted defaults that may make it more appropriate for the risk that you're looking to mitigate. All we're trying to do here is just highlight the, the principal differences between the features of credit insurance and the trade receivable put. And the first two of those, not surprisingly, are the ones that we think are most important. Uh, firstly, the trade receivable put is a single name uh, product. It doesn't require that you uh, uh, attach or, or bring a whole portfolio of risk to us. And that's really important because it allows for two things. One, a more bespoke credit risk management approach. You may only be worried about one or two credits in your portfolio and you're quite happy with it, the balance of names that are there. But secondly, it also has implications for cost, um, which we talk about a little bit lower down. But when you have a, a trade receivable put being put in place on a single name basis, you can identify the costs of dealing with a specific customer. And that may better inform your commercial negotiations with that client going forward. Uh, particularly if it becomes uh, meaningful. As we mentioned, uh, trade credit insurance is, is typically available on, on investment grade or, or high quality credit quality names. The trade receivable put is available on investment grade companies as well as distressed names or, or names for which trade credit insurance isn't actually available. Again, the coverage, uh, we look at many public and private companies as long as there's liquidly uh, traded debt or equity and, and publicly available financials or, or that the financials are uh, capable of being produced. For the names that are covered, uh, the contracts range, as Tom pointed out, a correction as well, it's from three months to three years. 
Um, it covers bankruptcy. It doesn't cover bank, uh, protracted default. And again, the coverage here is, is primarily uh, domestic names, North American names uh, that we would look at where we protect up to 100%. So again, we're not looking to only partially uh, protect uh, up to 80 90%. This is, uh, if you put in place a 20 million hedge, you're going to get $20 million from Wells Fargo Bank within that 35 to 45 day period in the event of a bankruptcy. There are no deductibles in this product. Um, there's also no reporting required, and, and I think that's very important as well. Tom touched on it earlier on. It's non-intrusive. We don't look to get involved in the underlying commercial transactions at all. And secondly, it's not a publicly disclosed market, so the obligor isn't informed. And, and that can be important for some of you where, where there's any sensitivity around an issue like this. I think uh, at this point we're going to stop for Justin, and we're going to do some type of was it a Q and A, Justin? Or yeah, if anyone does have any questions at this point, uh, we we've, we've hit sort of a natural stopping point. So if anyone does have any questions, feel free to type them in right now, and we will I will uh, pose them to the group here. Um, we do have a couple questions that have come in already, um, so we'll get started. Uh, the, one of the questions is: Are you looking for a credit with the minimum amount of annual revenue? Um, Great question. We're not looking for a credit with min minimum annual revenue. Uh, there are three types of credits which we tend to traffic in with the product. Number one would be large publicly traded entities that have capacity in bond markets or loan markets and have a derivatives credit default swaps behind them. And those would naturally be companies that have large annual revenue. Uh, so. The first category that's easy to cover in our market are the names with derivatives behind them. The second are names without derivatives but have access to the bond and loan markets again. The third would be smaller privately traded credits where we can actually have uh, access to financials to underwrite our risk. So being in the group that we sit in in Wells Fargo, we actually have the capability to underwrite risk and take risk without a hedge in, in the background for us. In that case, it's always a matter of us being able to get access to periodic financials to actually underwrite the credit and be able to price what that risk is. And the other determining factor is if we have to go through the, the effort to underwrite the underlying credit, then we're usually looking for a bit of a larger deal than our normal trade receivable put minimum. So our normal minimum would be about 500000 you know, we're looking for something between two and a half and five million of notional coverage to be able to underwrite a specific credit. All right, great. Um, the next question we have is, what happens if the bankruptcy court does not accept the claims? Do you have recourse? Yeah, another great question. Uh, very educated, uh, uh, basic, basic listeners we have here, I, I like it because it makes our presentation a lot easier. Uh, so there is the theory of recourse in the trade receivable put. Again, great question. So what would happen is with the trade receivable put, since we're paying you way ahead of legal final order of the bankruptcy, if you bought $100 in protection from us, if the deal triggered, you deliver us $100 in claims, and then we pay you $100 35 to 45 days after. If during the life of the bankruptcy, any of the claims are what we call disallowed, and that disallowance is a pretty broad term. Uh, you can replace the disallowed claim with a good claim, and the contract is settled, no further, uh, nothing else is necessary. Number two, our contract allows a one year time period to argue with the bankruptcy administrator, the bankruptcy courts, that the disallowance was incorrect. If you're successful in defending that disallowance, then the contract is settled, nothing else is necessary. Number three, you can just refund us for the disallowed portion of the claim, not the entire claim. So in the, in the example, if there's $100 that we paid you and $1 is disallowed because you were supposed to send white shirts to a retailer and it ended up being a box of black shirts then you just refund us the $1 and you keep the 99 that essentially represents the good claim. So those are the, the three methods to essentially cure that recourse. That's a great question. All right. Um, we have a couple questions here about uh, 
the put and uh, foreign markets. So basically the question that we have is, does Wells offer puts in foreign markets for foreign subsidiaries? And can you expand on the eligibility of puts for foreign AR? Great question. So this is where I'm going to get a little bit gray and everybody on the line is going to start shaking their head thinking I'm ducking and diving, and bobbing and leaving. Uh, so being Wells Fargo, we are a remarkably domestic bank. If anybody knows this on the line, you're laughing at me right now. But what we, where it becomes a pretty big gray area is we have been able to offer coverage on the non-U.S. subsidiaries of U.S.-based entities. So for instance, if you look at Dell, I don't know if anybody on the line is in that, in that space, but if you look at Dell, the, the computer uh, manufacturer, they have a subsidiary just about every country of the world and have created a company that's probably the hardest company to analyze that I've ever seen. Uh, we've been able to offer protection on the non-U.S. Dell subsidiaries in the way that we hedge ourselves is with the Dell U.S. entity. So we'll sell you protection on a non-U.S. sub as long as we have something in the U.S. to attach ourselves to. So the roundabout answer to that is yes, we can offer protection on the non-U.S. subs of what's probably going to be a U.S. entity. Uh, we have also been able to quote some non-U.S. credits that have access in the U.S. capital markets, like a Michelin tire or, or a name like that. So we have to revolve ourselves around the U.S. somehow, but that's uh, a very broad definition where, you have, yes, we have been able to offer coverage on non-U.S. stuff. Right. Um, another question we have is, do you underwrite private companies that do not have public debt? We do, but to be dead honest with everybody on the uh, on the line, nine times out of ten, when we try to underwrite one of those credits, we can't get access to financials. If again, and if we can get access to financials, we will go private on a credit and underwrite it. Again, we're looking for between two and a half to five plus million in emotional coverage to be able to take one of our analysts offline and do that work. But if we can get access to financials, we can definitely look at a credit. But again, for those private companies, the Everybody on the line knows sometimes those financials are pretty hard to take up by. All right, so then a question that sort of ties in very well with the last one that was just asked, uh, what type of documents do you consider for financials? Great question. We would like to see, of course, audited annuals, and then uh, if we can, quarterlies in between, but at least the audited annual. All right, great. Um, what about is the minimum $500,000 coverage pertaining to one individual account covered or total of all accounts covered? So it tends to be for, another great question, put me on the, on the spot, tends to be for one specific transaction. Uh, although if, if you do need protection on more than one entity that would total up to $500,000, still give us a call and we can we're, we, you know, that's not a hard line for us, to be dead honest. I'm kind of giving up the ghost here. But it's, uh, if, if you're looking for protection around 500000 across a couple different entities, it's something we could consider. All right. Uh, another question that we have is, is the put available in situations where the contract is with a subsidiary of a public or private company with traded debt, but the specific financial statements are not publicly available for the entity that they're in contract with? Yeah, we can definitely consider that. Uh, not to make a short answer on that one, but yes, we'd like to uh, we'd like to look at those. All right, um, and then we also have how strict are the assignment of eligible AR agreements? Uh, so it's very broad. If you read our documentation, which we're happy to send everybody on the line, by the way, read our master agreement. We're not asking for specific uh, required uh, documentation to to prove the claim. We're asking for essentially anything that exists. Uh, pertaining to the account receivable claim. So it's very broad. So and I'm just taking that a little bit further, as I read the question, I look to see that we're, we're, not, necessarily, we're not looking to attach ourselves to specific AR transactions. Uh, by that I mean the, the, the trade receivable put should be really seen as, as an overlay, uh, as a hedge, rather than being tied very specifically to any one invoice. And the reason that is simply is that uh, if you were to enter into a trade receivable put with us, it, it would cover existing invoices that are out, outstanding, obviously, uh, as mentioned earlier on, but not in dispute, but also uh, contemplated invoices based on uh, your expectation of activity with that entity going forward. So based on either your own transactional commercial history with that obligor or the anticipated level of act activity based on your conversations with that obligor, either way, the trade receivable put can be put in place now for as yet unproduced or undocumented 
uh, account receivable. So we, we don't ask in our documentation that you specifically list invoice numbers that you're asking to cover. Uh, that's not the case. All right, so uh, I think with that, thank you guys for a lot of great questions there, and we're going to move on to the next part of the presentation. If you guys have any more questions, you can feel free to type them in at any time, and we'll save them for the second round of Q&A at the end of the presentation. So, so moving on, and, and, and as mentioned earlier on, the emphasis really on this, in, on this presentation is really to get the audience uh, thinking more about using trade receivable put in scenarios other than when uh, it, it's a distressed name. I mean, very few people, as Tom mentioned, are aware of the product. Uh, thankfully, looking at the results of the poll, quite a lot of you are actually familiar with the trade receivable put, and, and hopefully more of you are now as a result of the, uh, the, the earlier part of the presentation. Uh, but those that do know the trade receivable put still think of it as being a product that's offered on high yield and distressed credit, uh, where insurers and factors have canceled their coverage. Uh, and as a result, it's been pigeonholed as the trade receivable put has been pigeonholed as being an expensive product. Um, hopefully, discussion so far, we've been able to dispel that perception. The, the reality is the trade receivable put is available for, for many credits that, are, that aren't in distress. You know, importantly, the cost of coverage for higher quality credits can be a fraction of the price uh, uh, when compared to uh, distressed credit. Uh, particularly because the trade receivable put is of errors, it really does offer a great opportunity to, to hedge out a core amount, if you will, of exposure out multiple. If you tip your annual sales to one obligor are anywhere between the range of 50 to $100 million. Um, and again, I, I hate to put numbers on it to create the perception that that's what we're looking for, but just for purposes of example, if we're saying that your annual sales are going to be anywhere near 50 to $100 million, then it's conceivable that that 50 million at the very minimum would be your core level of activity. And you may want to hedge that out, given where the pricing is right now. You may want to hedge that out for uh, up, anything up to three years. And then using shorter data trade receivable quotes, again, all governed under the same documentation. Um, you could use shorter data puts to handle any of the variability that gets you closer to the 100 million, but on a shorter term basis. So when you think about the, the fact that it's a non cancelable product. Uh, when you put this core protection in place, you can you can rest assured that you know Wells Fargo isn't going to turn around halfway through and say, uh, you know, we don't we don't like this product anymore. The credit's a little bit more distressed. We're actually going to we're going to tear up the uh, the paper it's written on and walk away. We're we're not in a position to do that. Uh, it's a non cancelable product. It can cover your core activity. It can be done very cheaply, and shorter data products can handle any variability. I think next case study uh, can pertain to a lot of different situations here. The, the, the crux of this case study is we, we do deal with some uh, Asian companies who hedge all of their account receivable exposure. So just as a general mandate, if you do business with a counterparty, it has to be hedged. Now, the problem with that strategy is that it can actually uh, make their account receivable portfolio less diverse than they would like because there'll be several names in the universe that they aren't allowed to do business with. And they implement, these companies implement the trade receivable put as a way to get coverage on things which they otherwise are not able for. Uh, and the net effect of that you might notice is that without the trade receivable put, their account receivable portfolio would be more concentrated to a smaller number of companies. And because the trade receivable put is something that they use, it allows them to do more business with more people, essentially diversifying their uh, their AR portfolio. Uh, the Sears case study I'm going to spend a, a, more than a minute on here. Um, this is the, uh, the longer case study in our book. Uh, definitely some take home reading for everybody on the line. But this is uh, the example of we are always seeing credit managers and CFOs and, and decision makers attempt to only buy coverage on bad news. They do what I describe as catching the falling knife. So instead of taking a proactive approach to managing credit risk, uh, they're taking a very reactive approach. Uh, this can be exacerbated when using things like trade credit insurance because at the time that a credit deteriorates is usually the time when a trade credit insurer or, or, or the traditional methods to hedge AR risk would be coming off of cover. The answer there has always been, well, let's use the receivable put market to hedge, which you can, but there is a cost associated with that. And these couple of pages are our uh, uh, best shot of putting numbers to what that actually means. 
So if you look at the graphs we have at the bottom of page 14 here, um, you'll see we're talking about Sears, which I think is a pretty good uh, case study for this, this type of activity, or this type of way of, of uh, using a, a reactive rather than a proactive approach at hedging credit risk. You'll see early on in 2011, uh, trade receivable put pricing. And by the way, these curves or these graphs are the credit default swap pricing because there is no public source for trade receivable put pricing. But you'll see that trade receivable put pricing early in this graph was at about 35 basis points per month. Where you see the big spike here, uh, it represents when CIT factoring had announced cancellation and starting to back off of coverage for Sears. At that time, the market took that news very negatively. The market was still open, but receivable put pricing became extraordinarily expensive, called 3.5 and 4% per month. Over time, as the news kind of calmed down on the credit, although it was still obvious that there were some issues here, trade receivable put pricing then tightened back into the 35 to 45 basis point level. And I think this is as a dynamic of what we described before, the current capital markets are very, very liquid with a lot of investor money chasing very little supply. So you'll see distressed credits like a Sears as the news calms down, tighten into levels which are probably tighter than they were where they should be trading because of that technical in terms of money chasing after supply. You'll start to see pricing after that 35 to 40 basis, 45 basis point uh, mark on the, on the graph there start to widen out again, major credit insurers continue to announce cancellations, factors tended to back off of coverage, and then at the very end of our graph here represents the point where trade receivable put pricing largely became unavailable or very difficult to source. So even though we do remain open well into a credit, there is a point where even the trade receivable put can run out of capacity and seem to be no longer available. On the next page is where we try to put numbers to what this all means. To, to the timeline we just laid out for Sears. The proactive approach, we think, would have been to look at coverage August 1st, 2013, and buy it to March 20, 2015. We were open to that at the time. The cost would have been 40 basis points per month. The coverage would have covered you for both the 2013 and 2014 holiday season. This would have been very proactive, so hedging for a longer period of time when the market seemed to calm down on this credit. The dollar cost of $1 million in coverage for that time period would have been $79,467, assuming 60-day terms, which I think is kind of the standard for Sears. Uh, the cost per shipment, which I know that's what everybody on the phone care, or on the line, I should say, cares about. So the cost of shipment in 60-day terms would have been roughly $8,800. Now the approach would have been to wait until the insurers backing off of coverage and the news became topical again. At that point, you would have protection in August 1st, 2014, maturing March 20th, 2015. The reason for those dates is that that is the maximum tenor we would have written at that time. We would have not gone longer. The cost would have been 3% per month, substantially more than 40 basis points per month. Uh, the coverage obviously would only have covered over the 2014 holiday season. Um, the dollar cost of one million for that shorter time period would have been two hundred and thirty one thousand dollars, extraordinarily high. Assuming sixty day terms again, cost per shipment is seventy seven thousand dollars. So in, in, in this example you could see where how pricing can move with a capital market based instrument. Uh, again, not a fair comparison because we were open when others were closed, but also the cost of that reactive approach can be substantial versus using a proactive method to hedge credit risk. So for comparison then, we, 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 we thought we'd insert Best Buy as a, to, to highlight the opportunities that exist right now in terms of being proactive with respect to an A. We're not, we're not suggesting for a moment there's anything wrong with Best Buy's credit and, and certainly the pricing that you see, which is illustrated by the CDS levels as a proxy for where the traders will put would be, uh, is, is very tight. Um, what the graph doesn't show you, in fact, is that the curve for Best Buy is actually quite flat out in the two and three year area as well. So when we, when we look at the Sears case study, we, you know, we, we still remind ourselves that the trade receivable put is non-cancellable in, in nature. And because you can put in place coverage on names like uh, Best Buy for longer than one year, you potentially can lock in that core coverage that we're talking about earlier on. 
Um, if, if you go back to the reactionary approach to hedging with the trade receivable put, Tom's point with here is it's still possible, but when you look at the reactionary approach on the previous slide, that's 23% for the cost of coverage on, on uh, trade receivable put at that point in time. That's enough to wipe out most vendors' margins, depending on the type of product that you're looking at. So if, if, you come, if you are reacting to a credit event, you're going to be doing it at a time when the pricing of the credit protection will have, will have widened, and that will be reflected in the cost, the, the cost of the trade receivable put. When you look at, at Best Buy, and, and we use Best Buy not only because of where the pricing is right now, but also because of the sheer capacity that exists out there. Uh, Tom mentioned earlier on uh, manu uh, electronics manufacturers that hedge all of their account receivable exposure. Uh, um, there are entities out there that deal with Best Buy for whom they need uh, coverage on every single uh, account receivable that they have with them. Uh, either that's because it's determined by the board uh, or for whatever other reason. But the reality is trade credit insurers have capacity issues on names like Best Buy simply because of the sheer volume of uh, receivables that are out there. So in terms of uh, looking at the coverage right now, just to, to move through this fairly uh, promptly, if, if you're looking at, at Best Buy right now, you could hedge out two or three years at levels that are very, very attractive, um, and you know that you're going to do it where broader mac macro events that could affect, affect the trade receivable pricing uh, won't have effect on the contract that you put in place for two or three years. Um, another example, uh, J.C. Penney, uh, another brick and mortar retailer, and, and we're conscious of time here. So. I'm going to uh, scoot through these. I, I, hopefully you all have the slides that you can look through uh, at your own leisure whenever you're uh, having a sleepless night. Certainly this might help. Um, but that's an entity that was having declines in, in same store sales, same store sales uh, and margins. Uh, it continues to be the case now. Usually we, we update these graphics every quarter, so we're due to update, update these now. But just to give you an indication of where they're trading right now, they're range bound between about 350 to 400 basis points per month. Uh, again, buying at a time when the credit is stressed can be so expensive that it, it, it may actually erose your, erase your entire margin here. So really... Sorry for correction, it's 35 to 45 basis points per month, not greater 50 to 400. In terms of the, the CDS levels is, is what I meant, but you're, you're absolutely right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, another example, Avon Products. Uh, they recently suffered uh, some downgrades, uh, and again, the updated graph will show that that's actually come in a little bit. Uh, since the uh, activity with TPG, uh, but again, it capped out again in the last couple of weeks with respect to non-dollar uh, exposure that it has, particularly with respect to the markets like the Swiss franc. So again, this type of volatility, if you were able to put in place a trade receivable put in September or, or, or June of 2014, you're going to be doing it at much more favorable levels uh, than you would do uh, in more recent times. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over Toys R Us. And the story there is that we are open for coverage. Toys R Us, very, very levered private equity style entity. Uh, we are open, but the graph there will show you how pricing has been uh, uh, acting or widening based upon the, the market's concern of leverage on that, on that name. Uh, I think the, the last case studies we, we want to just discuss with you would have to do with how the receivable put can integrate into a funded solution. Uh, that's one of the other, the second derivative of the receivable put that a lot of people haven't pursued is if you're using an ABL uh, transaction to fund working capital, is there a way that the trade receivable put can benefit? And essentially it can. What we've been able to do is write receivable put coverage to entities who are looking to buy protection and assign the benefit of the receivable put to an ABL provider. And essentially those banks that are providing the ABL line when they have the benefit of the receivable put directly uh, deferred to them, are able to give better treatment on the ABL. It solves concentration issues. It solves credit issues. So again, uh, something that a lot of people haven't thought about is how it can benefit a funded solution, and it can definitely benefit uh, in terms of ABL. Also benefits in terms of factoring. So we have worked directly with factors. We have worked with the clients of factors, and again defer the benefit of the trade receivable put to the factor. So if a trade receivable put were to trigger, we would pay the factor or we would pay the ABL. And because of that, clients have gotten better uh, capacity or better treatment against those uh, specific transactions. And actually, one final point there is because we don't look to file a perfected interest on, on, the, on the account receivables, 
uh, the benefit of the uh, the uh, transaction can be redirected to the ABL provider. All we require is that when the eligible receivables are being delivered to us in the event of a bankruptcy, are being done so free and clear of all liens. And that's another reason why it's viewed very favourably by uh, ABL and, and factor providers. Uh, similarly, on the last slide, again, there's a lot in there, but essentially the trade receivable put can work with a securitization such as a commercial paper uh, funding instrument, something that both Tom and I are very familiar with from our previous uh, previous lives. Uh, one or two slight modifications would be required to the trade receivable put, but essentially it can be used uh, to support account receivables being sold into a CP conduit where trade credit insurance typically hasn't really been accepted by the capital markets as a uh, as a viable alternative to hedge the uh, account receivables. All right, so uh, with that, I know we are at time. Um, we're going to still leave this open for anyone who can stay a few minutes over, and we'll open, uh, open it up for a question and answer again. Um, if anyone does have to leave, if you guys could fill out the survey on your way out, that, again, gives us a lot of great insight into how we can continue to make these better for you guys moving forward. Um, but with that, we do have a couple questions in here already, so I'm going to start off the Q&A. Um, the first question is, uh, we sort of touched on it, but why would you enter into a put on an account that does not represent a lot of risk or a non-distressed account? I think there's a lot of reasons why you would uh, hedge a non-distressed account. Uh, if you believe in our theory of hedging credit risk consistently over time, not trying to catch the falling knife, Target Canada would be the ultimate example of that. A lot of people that probably considered that better than government risk are now holding a claim worth 30 to 50 cents on a dollar, maybe. So that could be one of the reasons why, why you had to risk like that. The other reason would have to do with funded uh, alternatives. A lot of the deals we do uh, to support ABLs are not on distressed credit. They're on a very good credit, but they have a concentration issue. So you're an auto parts manufacturer that is concentrated in General Motors. Uh, you're hitting that concentration limit on the ABL and ex excluding some a, uh, AR from the borrowing base. Uh, you would then use the trade receipt put to cure that. So get a credit which you may be completely fine with, uh, but that you would want to hedge for the ancillary benefit of it. Uh, in addition, if you're using trade credit insurance on your whole portfolio, then your trade credit insurance at, at some point, even they, they benefit from an asymmetry of information, right, because they're dealing with a number of clients that have exposure to these entities. Uh, and while everything may appear uh, perfectly fine in terms of your, uh, your receivables, uh, generally speaking, if they're picking up on it, duration and a credit, a number of things can happen. One is they can reduce their limit, uh, which they're providing to you. In fact, they can step away entirely from the credit because they do have that optionality. And, and also, they can actually put in place a surcharge for covering, for continuing to cover that particular name. And we've come across that quite, quite a lot recently. Um, and that surcharge is basically going to reflect the cost of coverage that the trade credit insurer requires in order to continue providing protection. So if you have the trade receivable put in place, uh, pricing that you're comfortable with well in advance of any deterioration in the credit risk. And those graphs in the presentation uh, do show various examples of where the credit default swaps as a proxy for trade receivable pricing have gapped out. Then you're not going to be too concerned about what's happening to that credit. All right. Um, another question we have here is, what is the benefits of the receivables put compared to other risk management tools in regards to flexibility, coverage, pricing, execution, and, and coverage level? Yeah, that covers a lot. But. So when you're looking at a credit default swap, again, I can't stress enough, that credit default swap is not designed to offer you protection on your account receivable. It's going to give you protection at the bond entity, which nine times out of ten is going to be substantially different than the account receivable invoicing entity. And you can realize a very negative recovery event because of that. The bonds are always issued out of entities that are favorable to benefit the bondholders or the loan. So in that case, the credit default swap you'll discover is not going to line up correctly. The receivable put has essentially been designed to, to replace that credit default swap, but offer you protection at the correct entity. And also, if you buy a credit default swap, you're buying a derivative, and your accountant is going to require you to use mark-to-market accounting on that, which if you're talking about some of the credit that's, that we traffic in is extremely uh, volatile. So something uh, the receivable put's been designed to do is to not be a derivative. All right, um, and it looks like the last question we have here is uh, the fee based on sales or accounts receivable and the frequency of the charge. The fee is based on the amount of coverage purchased. So 
It's a blanket amount of coverage. Dave had mentioned earlier that it may cover invoices that were created in the past. It's going to cover invoices that will be created in the future. So we don't charge our fee on invoices. And again, we're not asking for any information on invoices. We're charging our fee just based on the notional amount of coverage purchased. All right, so with that, uh, I think we're going to shut down the webinar at this point. Um, I'd first like to thank David and Tom for taking the time out to present to us today, and thank all of you guys for taking time out of your day to listen to our presentation. Um, on behalf of Credit to Be and Wells Fargo, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, we also will be sending a copy of the presentation slides to you shortly as well as contact information for all of us if you do have any follow-up questions that you weren't able to ask today. Um, so with that, thank you guys again, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.